hello and uh, welcome to the uh, weekly Hood Uni Games cast, coming to you still from our home offices. And uh, today I'm joined by uh, Matt. Hello. And then uh, we've got Josh and Chris and Oliver from Canalside Studios who are joining us. And as you might be able to guess from that, we're going to talk about um, Canalside Studios, the history and our uh, or their latest title. So let's roll the intro. Cool. So let's bring them out of. Uh, I'm going to unmute them both for now. So they're both in this. In other, uh, all three of them are in the chat. Um, but I think before we uh, bring them into the conversation, uh, Matt, should we talk a little bit about the history of Canalside Studios? Yeah. So uh, for those that don't know, um, Canalside Studios is our in-house game studio at the University of Huddersfield. Uh, it's run by our students, so our students will um, be part of the uh, development team from programmers to artist designers, and they're going to be running it uh, the day-to-day -day, um, of the studio with uh, myself and Duke uh, there as uh, managers and producers, making guiding it in the right direction. So I've got a bit, so, of a bit of a slide here on the history. So all the way back in 2006, which seems like a lifetime ago, as it's been through so many stages, which we'll talk about in a bit. But <coughs> we did just do a quick count. We've got we've had 112 students through the studio over the last, well, since 2006 or 14 years. Um, this lot will be finishing to make our to make the 112 in the summer or in August, which I think is pretty amazing, really, how many have been through the system and out there in industry. Um, and, and working in in games companies now, m many times off the back of their portfolios, but also the studio titles that they've built, um, which is pretty cool. Um, we're based in Spark Jones, so you can see some some of the stills there from some of the marketing shots we've had done over the years. Uh, it is on campus, which makes it different to a, a more traditional studio that's based out in the world. You know, uh, you know. A, an industrial park or a business park, whatever it might be, it is actually on campus. It's in our, so as I say, it's in Spark Jones building, so it's near teaching. Teaching happens nearby, but it still runs as a commercial entity designed to make games, uh, release games, and make money. That's it. That's the point. Uh, it has its own dedicated space. So those pictures there are. Um, that's it. No one else goes in those spaces. Um, I mean, obviously tours and things, but no, no, um, no students work in there. It's generally just for them, um, which is pretty cool. We take eight students a year, so that 112 should divide by eight. Um, yeah, should do. <laughs> Not quick enough. Um, about eight. Oh, no, we've had it. I don't know why. It doesn't divide by eight because there'll be a couple of years, I think, where we had nine in the studio, didn't we? So that would have that would make that number slightly off. Um, but we generally take um, from our games design course and our games programming course, usually half and half, so half programmers, half designers, uh, this is a unique year where we've got uh, seven designer artists and one programmer. So luckily Josh is uh, able to join us today. Um, and then just a note there that it's one year. So it's a one year placement. It starts around September. Um, the students propose, uh, I say students, they are paid. So they're a bursary students at that point. They pitch and propose their game ideas. Uh, Matt and I uh, listen, give feedback and approve whichever game idea is the one that they want to make. So um, let's just, uh, we've got a few slides, I think, on some of the... Um, actually, Matt, you want to do this yeah. slide because it was your idea to separate into these these three phases, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest things that we, we focus on and was kind of said in the last slide is making sure that uh, a student in Canalside has the opportunity to get some industrial experience and get a release title uh, on their CV, um, which is all part and parcel of trying to make a student uh, employable, because that's what uh, employers want from a student uh, in the games industry. So he's got experience making a title. But uh, over uh, since 2006, we've kind of, I've kind of split it into three phases um, of this, that the studio has gone in. So it started off in the very early days, um, very much about games and actually heavily focused on the Xbox 360, because the Xbox 360 at the time had a, a big push for um, 
sort of indie developers before anybody else. So they had the community games um, drive, and then they had Xbox Live Arcade, and then they had Xbox Indie Games. Um, so for three years, basically, um, the students were pushing towards Xbox 360 using the dev kits that we got in the studio. And then for a while, um, the studio sort of experimented a little bit um, in what it wanted to do, whether it was it was about the time that the um, the original iPhone came out, um, and there was this big push for apps and wanting to uh, see what could be done in that that field. Um, at the same time, sort of delving into serious games and doing some projects um, for different institutions like the fire department and uh, the Royal Armoury, and just doing some research-driven serious games, as well as some mobile stuff and then um, you and I um, took over the studio uh, running it in uh, the, the, the end of 2015 uh, and we decided to go back to its roots and focus on uh, pure game dev uh, and it kind of coincided with um, Steam Greenlight at the time yeah. being a thing so we could actually get our, get the games through the Steam Greenlight process uh, and release that way. Uh, and so we've had some, some pretty good successes since then. I think it's worth mentioning that actually these, the games we've put on the right there, we should put links to those because they're all on, uh, or four I of them are on that, Steam. So. Yeah, yeah, those links do come through uh, in the later slides. Oh, okay, cool. I was going to put them on, so we put them on uh, underneath the um, the YouTube video as well. Oh, yeah, we can do that. Yeah. So Hexathermic, I remember this one. So, yeah, Hexathermic is obviously before my time teaching at the mm -hmm. uni, but um, uh, from what I can gather was um, a little bit of an experimentation uh, design uh, by Daryl Markles, one of our uh, lecturers that you've obviously seen on some of the chats before. Um, and it wanted, I, think, I think the studio at the beginning, if I'm right, Duke, was, wasn't all game students, it was multimedia students as well. Uh, well, that was, that was before the studio existed. So the, the studio was preceded by a, a different type of studio. So for a long time, there was a web studio, it only ever had two or three students in it. And it was doing real web development with under John Kelly, who's now in ADA. And that existed from the 90s, I think, sometime. Um, but it, it, uh, it, I don't, it, I don't know when that one faded out. But at some point, it was, it was abandoned anyway, um, and the studio was modelled on that, but on, on a larger scale. So, but the first year, it only ran with programmers. So, Hexathermic, I think, was the end of the, or the the, cro the transition between the older web-based studio uh, and the launch of Canal Site Studios as a games one. So, effectively, there was going to be games and web at the same time, and then I think the web one, when John moved to eighty-eight, it disappeared. Uh, and Canalside was born then, but the games design degree didn't run, so it was the first year was just eight programmers, which is I think where Hexathermic was around that same time. And the next slide again is was just programmers at least to begin with. Um, and then games design had a final year, the year after. I think that was missing real when the designers arrived. Yeah, so I think yeah, you're right. The Hexathermic was uh, very programmer driven. Yeah. Uh, and then the next slide, which is uh, Yoho Kablamo. Is. This is when my see. I'm still waiting. I, I should add that for those who watched last week, I'm still waiting for my new PC parts to arrive. <laughs> so we're, yeah. we're struggling on again, but I think it's not too. The frame so, Yoho Kablamo is probably the first big title that the studio worked on. Um, it was for Xbox Live Arcade, um, which was massive at the time. A uh, big sort of push for smaller indie titles. Um, you got your uh, Braid and. Super Meat Boy and all things like that through Xbox Live Arcade back in the day. But Yoho Kabamo is this sort of multi couch co op competitive multiplayer um, pirate shoot 'em up type, type game. Um, and it, as I got a little, little uh, image there saying that it came second place in the, the XNA Dream Build Play competition, which is uh, one of the reasons why it got the contract with Microsoft. I, I always liked this game. I remember having many, many debates about the control mechanism because you can change the controls. There's the one where your direction is whichever way the ship goes, and there's the other one which I think is the steering of the ship. I still think it's a great game, really playable. Um, I think it's still available on Xbox. 
on the marketplace. Yeah, you, can, you can technically still go and download it yeah. from Xbox Live Arcade if you have a 360. Yeah. It's, um, uh, I, still, I, I always enjoyed it as a game. Same with Hexathermic. I, I like both of them as games. Uh, yeah, should we move uh, on to go on to? Yeah, so I could, like I this one, this one kind of started with just programmers. Yeah. And then the designers came on board. It's one of the only two. Once that, go on, sorry. No, once that course uh, kicked off and got into its placement year, um, the designers came on and did the art for it. Yeah, I think it's one of only two games that took uh, more than a, one year, which is what we normally put into these these things. Mm -hmm. So then it was Missing Real. And, and so Missing Real is um, an Xbox Live indie game, which was that kind of uh, the platform that came came after Xbox Live Arcade. So um, you kind of, to get on Xbox Live Arcade, you needed a publisher um, to actually foot the bill and talk to Microsoft and get that sorted. Uh, and then Microsoft had this initiative to uh, allow self-publishing onto the platform. So Missing Real was self-published onto Xbox Live Indie Games. It wasn't called uh, Indie Games back then, was it? Wasn't it called Xbox? Was it called Live it's, Marketplace it's, or something? Uh, no, that came later. Oh, was it called Indie Games? All right. So I think, I think it started off as Xbox Live Community, and then they rebranded Community and allowed self-publishing to Indie Games. Yeah. And then I think that Marketplace thing came a bit later, uh, if okay. I remember correctly. Okay. I don't know. I'm not a console uh, but missing, Yeah, but Missing Real is basically twin stick shooter co-op uh, game mm. that is themed around B movies. Um, so really campy um, space and action orientated. So um, you've got your um, Arnold Schwarzenegger type character and you've got your uh, alien type uh, scenarios and different things like that. So it's just uh, a full blown co-op twin stick shooter and actually relatively fun mm. sort of thing for its time anyway. I enjoy it. Um, I, I enjoyed it. And I think one thing that uh, now students nowadays need to remember is that uh, there weren't um, the Unreal Engine and Unity Engine and things that you could just start playing around with. So all of these games at the beginning, they had to build their own engine to start with. Yeah. Uh, so they used XNA, which has a, which is a framework which does some of the some of the heavy lifting, but not as much as they do nowadays. No, it's a simpler time. Yeah. Oh, and then this is the the slide on when we. I had that alternative attempt at trying to, to mix research and do some interesting stuff outside of traditional games development, which was pretty cool, actually. We did some cool stuff with the Royal Armouries and um, the Fire Engine Simulator, which we still got the, the chair and the, the screens for in the studio from when that existed. Um, uh, but it was, I think we, we was and the students quickly realized that the students wanted commercial titles that they could give out to studios when it came to getting a job and you know rather than a research title which might be more focused on simulation than it is on let's say graphics or characters or whatever it or environments whatever it is that those students were interested in so we we w went back to more traditional games dev which is where pocket galaxy came from oh yeah i'll just uh shrink the audio on that one whoops let's go back uh, can't get rid of the little thingy in the middle. Go away, slide. Did you know that that's a thing? <laughs> no. Um, it's, so like, <laughs> it's like, what, oh, there we go. There we go. No, when you roll over the thing. Uh, what are you trying to do? Uh, mute it. Oh, sure. It's not oh. already muted. No, oh. no. That's, uh, that's my fault then. Yeah. Might need to refresh the page. I think some of them might not be there going forward. Okay. Um, the uh, Pocket Galaxy was the first year that. Uh, you and I took over managing. We, we, like you say, we went back to let's get some commercial titles. Yep. Um, let's change the focus away from a little bit academia and a little bit serious games and actually just get to entertainment based games. So yep. um, that year group um, in 2015 16 um, had uh, two titles come out of it. Um, the first two, uh, one was Pocket Galaxy, which is this. Um, mobile um, tapper game, so uh, uh, tap heroes and uh, tap, tap, titans, was it? tap titans. Tap titans. Tap titans. There were there was a load of just tappers at the time and click games um, that were really really taking off. Uh, and so the studio sort of decided that they want to go down this Bruto 
making one for mobile uh, and the way that you did it is you were just going through um, blowing up planets and getting resources to buy more ships which allow you to blow up more planets which allow you to get more resources to blow up more planets and um, I personally didn't really get it fully because it was just at, at, at some point in the game it plays itself um, but it did pretty well on um, iOS it got featured um, and it's uh, which it's still on iOS, isn't it, right now? It is. It's still on Android as yeah. well, I think, yeah, as well. Uh, and one, I can't remember, because we've not updated it. I think one of them has been pulled for not being updated. Um, I can't remember. I can't, I can't remember which version, on iOS or, or Android. But uh, for its time, it was it was a very look, nice, fun little tapper game. Um, so waste time, waste time thing. Uh, and it was the studio experimenting a little bit with microtransactions um, and ad-driven revenue. So it's a free game. Free to download, yeah. free to play, yeah. um, and actually, the uh, micro transactions are not really required at all. Um, you could literally just watch a couple of the um, ad. Because uh, every now and again, a little asteroid will fly by, and if you tap the asteroid, you can get a you can watch a video, and it'll give you some more uh, of the resources. And pretty much, that's enough to play it. So. It was kind of a, a, a little bit of an experiment at the time where in the game industry, microtransactions were taking off. Um, nowadays, microtransactions are, no one likes them. Everybody doesn't want to have anything to do with them, if they can. Um, but at the time, they were, they were sort of this brand new sort of, hmm, maybe we could actually experiment with that. It's worth mentioning, uh, I think one thing you mentioned was uh, you didn't understand the game. I, I didn't understand the whole concept at the point at the beginning in the sense of how, why is that fun? But it's worth noting that, you know, although we run the studio <clears throat> in a producer role, we do let the students. So we, you know, we, we let the students propose this idea and run with this idea when they convinced us that, that it was interesting. So, you know, when it's not a, I guess to highlight, it's not a dictatorship. You don't arrive, the students don't arrive and me and Matt say, make this game. You know. Oh, no, not at all. They, they pitched the idea with a business plan and market research, and it showed that there was this gap for something like this, the clicker game. And so um, as, as managers, you're going to look at that research and look at that hmm. data and go, yeah, okay, well, let's run, run with it and see how it goes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the, as you said, the second game then, Hover Havoc. Yeah, is, so Hover uh, Havoc was made in the, with the same team. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a team of eight students, and um, they split. They them, kind of split. They split, they split two, themselves. Yeah. yeah, they split themselves into two two teams of four almost. So, so two programmers, two artists. Um, and this one was a, a, a multiplayer. Oh, it's lagging a bit on their Twitch. I know. I'm just watching my CPUs. Every single one's at ninety nine percent or a hundred. <laughs> Yeah, I think you don't need a new machine. Too. It's on its way. Uh, It'll ship soon, hopefully today. <laughs> uh, so this is a, a multiplayer uh, couch co-op. Uh, you drive around in hover habits and you pick up. Yeah, yeah, power up pickups and uh, it's basically like a sumo wrestler. You have to knock each other off the arena, uh, and the arena will change as the level goes on and time goes on. So um, it was quite a little fun uh, little title. Um, and this went through Steam Greenlight and got, got Greenlight and got put onto the platform, which was good. And it, a year later, it got a, the, the team the following year did a Christmas update for it with uh, a couple of extra levels and power ups. So it was a nice little title, really, for the studio, which demonstrated sort of that, uh, co that multiplayer sort of ethos of let's just have some fun yeah. and make a, get, and make, make a game that is just fun to play. It's, it, this is this was green light when it was hard to be green. It wasn't not when you just paid the money. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 This, is, this is when you had to get votes. Yeah, uh, I think it was it was around uh, between twenty and thirty thousand votes you needed to be able to get near the top. Yeah, no, it, I was really impressed with it you're going through. It's a good game as well. Um, and then Flux Eight the following year, so all eight worked on this one. So that that first year. Uh, that we took over, we split the team, or well, they proposed two ideas, so it was split. But this year, all eight worked on this one. Yeah, um, well, actually, quite what's quite interesting about this year was they started the year by proposing two games. Mm. Um, and they, they started development on two. One was a 
uh, little dungeon crawler uh, game where you played the enemy, and there was a load of heroes kind of come through your dungeon, and you had to stop and get into the treasure. Yeah. Um, and the other game was this um, magnet puzzle game uh, where, but about halfway, just before Christmas, uh, around, around December time, we um, we reevaluated what those games were. We did some play testing uh, and realized actually that the magnet game had a little bit more um, interesting this, uh, interest to it. So we actually put the entire team on that, and this is what how what looks it became. Um, we did it just at the beginning though the uh, level editor was one of the best features of that game in the sense of uh, for rapid level development so there's loads of levels and in fact the release came with level editor so people could make their own levels um, yeah, well. so, yeah so yes on, on this on the steam version which you can go by uh, at the moment is that yeah there is a level editor built with it and you can upload, upload those levels that you build to the steam marketplace yeah and it's also worth mentioning that it's coming out on switch very yeah, soon, in the next, uh, we're waiting, or not we, uh, we'll, we'll explain in, uh, it's a, in a later stream how that's come about. Um, we'll get the, the guys who've done the port into the stream and they can tell us a bit about it. But uh, they're currently waiting for the store page to be approved by Nintendo. And then it will launch um, a couple of weeks after that. So we will we will promote it once it happens. And we'll get the, get the devs on board to tell us about um, the, the, the porting to Switch and the interesting challenges that that's posed. I'm looking forward to hearing about some of that. We know about some of it, but it'd be nice to hear it and again and in more detail. Yeah, and actually, I think uh, Fox Eight is one of my favourite games. I play, I played through it multiple times. Yeah, uh, and it's single player. It's co-op as well. You can because you play as these two different magnets for different polarizations, and you can play together in co-op. So I think it'll work really well on the Switch, mm -hmm. especially seen as just by coincidence, Nintendo released the controllers the same colours as, as the characters. Yeah. It's nice of Nintendo to do that, uh, yeah, to follow our, follow our color scheme. But uh, but yeah, we I've played it on the on the Switch Dev Kit version, and it was and it's lovely. I'm looking forward to getting it on the on my Switch. Anyway, so then it was uh, Coin Up the year after that. So Coin Up's a, a really interesting game. Though. So the way that this again, so it ran exactly the same. The team pitched their ideas, and they pitched loads of different ideas this to this year group. Um, um, some really ambitious ones, which just wouldn't have been feasible in a year. Um, uh, some that had some really interesting story ideas to them. Uh, and this one got pitched as theme hospital, but instead of a hospital, you run an arcade. And I, we just instantly went, yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, and over time, it developed to be um, animal based. So in, and instead of humans, at the arcade, it was different types of animals, and then it it, it developed this sort of um, uh, green eggs and ham, Doctor Zeus sort of distorted, cartoony art style, um, and all these different characters that that had a lot of intrigue to them. Uh, and the main premise of the game is that you start from the bottom, same way you do with the hospital, and you build up an arcade, and you get. You get your, your the the visitors to, to find out what type of games they like, so you can put more of those in. You have to give them facilities like uh, toilets and things to eat and stuff like that. And you just have to try and keep them there as long as you can. Um, and it went developed really well. Um, and I, it's probably one of those things really that is slightly unfortunate near near the end um, because the the team only runs for a year. Uh, and they have to release it. Um, coming up to release, basically, there was a lot of stuff that was stripped out of it last minute and put on the cutting room floor, um, which, it, which, in my opinion, actually actually does take away from the game a little bit. There was loads of nice little features, like different scenarios that would happen, but just because the, the development cycle, what it was, uh, those had to be removed. But it's still a nice little title mm -hmm. uh, that demonstrates... Uh, the different disciplines, and actually, majority of the students that worked on this have all got uh, all got jobs in the games industry for a different. Or um, I could say Ruben, but Ruben was Flux. Um, they're doing a masters. Uh, uh, Matt Watling, that was who I was thinking of. He went to do um, teaching instead. But uh, it's a nice little title. 
It is. And I think we've got one more before we get to this year. Yeah. So I'll so, hold on, Ollie, Chris, and Josh. We're nearly there. <laughs> so last year, the last year, um, we changed it up again, and we experimented with the VR. So uh, lads or little awesome dudes, uh, which is available on Steam um, and works on Oculus, HTC, HTC Vive, uh, etc. Is basically this: you're a guy that lives in your mum's basement, which starts off well, um, and you collect these little mini figures. Um, but if you put the figures onto the table in the middle of the room, they come to life, uh, and so you can actually then start doing like almost like a um, an RTS resource gathering sort of mini game on a table in a in a room that you can play around with. So inside the room, there's an arcade machine in the corner, there's a basketball, there's an RC car, there's all sorts of different things you can do. Um, but the main game that you're actually playing is a game within a game that you play on the middle. Um, and you have to go to your computer and you have to order new parts, which will then get delivered to you and you have to open the box. And it's this really immersive VR experience. Um, that actually demonstrates for the students that worked on it, especially. Um, you've got Lewis, who's now in, and uh, Sonny and Mark and, and uh, John, that are in final year right now, demonstrating to any employer that they can work and program for uh, quite a complex platform. Because to do a VR title is actually quite tricky. It is. Uh, and then the artists working in VR actually have a whole lot of limitations to work with. Um, that you don't think about in normal development um, as VR sort of rears its head of like all these different things you have to t take into consideration. So um, Lads is a really awesome little game. Um, and if anyone's got a VR headset, I, re I really recommend you go give it a try. Mm -hmm. um, with the caveat of it doesn't give you a tutorial. Uh, basically, the only tutorial in the game is... Uh, posters on the wall, which during playtesting very close to release and after releases that a lot of people just ignored yeah. um, and so didn't notice the game within a game sort of concept, um, which I think is if uh, if the team were to go back, I'd probably we say we need to put a, a more explicit tutorials sort of saying, no, there is this world that you can mess around in, but there is a game in the middle as well. That you, have to play. you can see the posters on the wall now. On the background, yeah, yeah, I agree. It was really cool being able to just play. I think the the mini games around the outside, uh, in some ways, distracted you from the main game because you ended up, like you say, you ended up playing with all the cool stuff around the outside and then forgetting or not noticing that there was a game right in the middle of the room. Yeah, yeah. So, no, it's and, really the, cool. and the yeah, I love how they added they added loads of interactivity as well. So mm -hmm. like just being able to move and manipulate pretty much anything. Not not quite not quite one hundred percent. Not as much as. Uh, um, say some like bone works that basically physically simulated everything in the, in the world pretty much but most things had interactivity and they added loads of little cool little features so like there was a scanner uh, next to the computer which um, watching people play very people, very few people touch uh, or interact with but if you take any object and put it in the scanner it will scan it and put it onto the, onto the computer and do something different and unique for everything that you do so mm -hmm. um, again this is a team uh, this is really impressive what they made because they started this at Christmas so they only worked on it for probably eight months Yeah, it's an eight month project because uh, they started on two different games they started on a little um, Metrovania style uh, platformer with, where your character would morph into different shapes and different abilities um, and a Papers Please style um you're working in a factory doing a monotonous thing, but then this crack to sort of like a fancy world would just creep through. It was quite an interesting concept, uh, but neither of them was going in the right direction. So this is when the lads idea came up around, around Christmas again. Okay. So that's, uh, that's a summary of what we've been doing over the last couple of years in Canal Side. That's a, um, a half hour summary. <laughs> I know. It's, uh, I, went, I went on a little bit there, but... Yeah. Okay. I think it's, it's, it's quite it's quite interesting to look at uh, what's happened, uh, and now we're going to bring um, 
Chris, Ollie, and Josh into the conversation. So they're all um, they're all unmuted and welcome to say hi. Can, do you want to? Uh, hey, hello, hello. Cool. Nice of you to. Thanks for joining us, guys, and uh, thanks for sitting through that half hour into history lesson <laughs> before we get to you guys. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, here's a little. There's an Oliver fading in. <laughs> this is the this is the team this year. So um, uh, as we said before, there are eight every year generally. Uh, it's a unique year, so Josh is the only programmer, so it's good to have him here to chat to us from a different perspective. Uh, Matt, I think you had some questions on this slide. I can't see the notes on my version. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, I, I forgot about the uh, uh, questions. Uh, <laughs> some good prep. Um, so first is introduce yourselves um, and what your role is. Um, yeah, sure, I'll go first. Um, so I'm Chris. Um, I'm one of the environment artists on uh, the game. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm Ollie. I'm um, a character artist in the game, and I've also done a bit of AI blueprints and behavior tree stuff as well to help out with the one program. <laughs> uh, hey, I'm Josh. Um, I do the most of the programming for the game. Um, I do a bit of the admin as well, um, some social media. Um, yeah, technical side. I do tech support as well. And then we've got the rest of the team, which is on the. Um, the slider right now we've got Lauren um, and Brad and Lewis uh, uh, and Oliver McGrath not Oliver Taylor who we've got here uh, they're the rest of the uh, RT designers we'll say uh, and then we've got Aaron who is uh, on the design course but he's more of a tech designer and um, still very good uh, animator he does a lot of the animation um, but that's the whole team uh, and they're all working extremely hard on their new title um, but before we get on to your new title, um, one thing we like to ask, and actually uh, a lot of our current students are probably quite interested in, is what it's been like working in the studio. I mean, yeah, it was, it's very good when we were at the studio. Like, because I think the majority of us have worked with each other before, it's quite an easy transition. And um, through all the games jams and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and we're kind of sort of confident with each other and kind of know each other's strengths. And then since we've transitioned from working from home, I mean, it's been relatively easy, I think, to start work up again, just because we were doing like daily discords and stuff like that. Well, you were just saying there, if we just, before we jumped to one of the others, you mentioned about working together in the past. I think the um, that switch to the game jams has been very useful in that sense allowing um, all of our students or most of our students to intermix as much as possible to have the most opportunities to work with everyone so um, I think that's probably helped in that sense of working with each other in the past and knowing strengths and weaknesses. We did that like games jam or we were, we were going to do a games jam at the start of the placement and we quickly decided like we don't really need to do it because we already pretty much a team. Yeah that's really good. Um, so the unique thing about the studio is that it is driven by students. There's the age of you in there, um, and then there's Duke and myself who are, aren't, aren't in there all the time. We pop in um, a few times a week if we can. But it's basically run by you. So what's it like working in a, in a studio that is driven by students? Um, yeah, I'll tell this one. Um, I'd say one of the hardest things about this is if someone doesn't, if I, if you're like doing like something new, for instance, normally in the industry, you could probably just go up to someone who's like hugely experienced and just ask ask them how to do it. In a uh, like a student company, you can't really do that if no one knows like how to do it because we don't get taught everything on the course, and that's for a good reason. You can't teach everything in game design. Uh, there's just not enough time and there's too much. So, um, one of the things that we've had to do a lot is just do a lot of research. It's been a lot of like testing ideas out, kind of like just learning as we go in. And I feel like only like in the past few months, maybe we've even got like the art style down. Let's say we've only just got like it took us like a while to get like certain mechanics in. Which um, yeah, so I'd say that's probably one of the hardest things about like working in a student company is just not everyone knows how to do everything. So you just got to like kind of like learn yourself. I think that's that's probably uh, quite quite an, an apt sort of statement. Is because if you were in a, a more commercial with veterans there, that you could learn from them as you go. But um, 
you probably had to rely quite heavily on each other to bounce ideas and new learning off, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I would say if, if someone doesn't know something, usually they'll just ask someone else. They'll go over, see if they know it. If not, then, I mean, it's to Google you go. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It's quite Fair interesting, enough. actually, because the point or one of the main, not the point, but one of the main reasons for university is to create independent learners. So, you know, I mean, how, how fantastic is that, that that was forced you, forcing you into that scenario where you, you have no choice but to learn independently uh, outside. Um, although I know that, Josh, you struggled early on with some of the code and had a harder time being by yourself and not having the ability to bounce ideas around. And I think the, um, do you want to talk a little bit about that and the, the industry involvement that helped there to kickstart that? Uh, I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. Okay. But yeah, it's, it's kind of hard being like one programmer working in Unreal Engine because obviously you're dealing with like Unreal's way of like C++ code. And <laughs> it's not the easiest thing to get started in. But I mean, I was able to talk to a couple of people that were tutors at the university I could talk to. Matt, you, um, you brought somebody in to like help me with it. And that eventually led to me finding the solution, which was really good. Yeah. So I, th I think that was um, uh, Luke from SigTrack Games came in and oh, gave yeah. you a little bit of support in uh, approaching problems in different ways, I'm sure you say. Yeah. I think, I think that, that seemed to help quite a lot uh, in the early stages. Yeah. So uh, you came in and you said you kind of, you'd worked with each other in the game jams roughly before. So uh, as a team at the beginning, what were your overall goals that you wanted to accomplish out of Countside? I think one goal that we all had um, was just trying to make a game that was actually fun and like people just wanted to play. Um, and then kind of, we wanted to develop uh, some social media interest to try and get as many people out there interested in our game as possible, which is a lot of the reason for why we've done a few of the things we've done this year. Yeah. I, um, think, I think that's probably one of the weakest points of the studio for the past, well, for a long time is that None of the games have really been marketed or, published or pushed in any way. So there's some really good titles like Flux 8 and, and Lads and uh, things that kind of just went into the world and very few people really know about them. Um, so I think you guys have done a, a really good job so far with your social media presence um, on Instagram especially. Um, so if anyone wants to follow the uh, Instagram account, uh, what's the tag for it again? Outside Studios. Isn't yeah, it? I think it's just yeah. Outside Studios. Yeah, because I can't remember if I've been on the score in it, but I think it's just at Outside Studios. We're very close um, to a thousand followers, so. Yeah. That'd be cool. We'll put a link under the YouTube video anyway in the description. So um, let's move on to your current title are, that you're working Are on. you ready for the reveal? Da, da, da. <laughs> Boom. Logo. Logo time. Mirror's tail. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> so, so uh, give us the pitch. Uh, what is Mirror's tail? So, pretty much, Mira is this daring young girl who was launched into this adventure to save her village, family, and restore balance and order to her island. Along the way, she'll explore forests full of forgotten ruins and ancient secrets, mystical landscapes covered in giant mushrooms and deep canyons, and tropical coastal jungles, all while battling enemies, solving puzzles, and swinging your way to returning the heart and normality to a village in peril. That's, that's our elevator pitch. So that, that's, that, that's your pitch for the game. That's your sort of, elevator. your elevator pitch, your blurb that you put along with it. Um, um, if people were, well, what's this similar to? Uh, so if anyone's interested in going looking at it, what's what's the what's what type of people would enjoy this? So there's a few sort of main game inspirations we've had. So we've had a bit of a Jack and Daxter in there, a bit of sort of rhyme as well for the kind of art style and sort of vibe to it. And then uh, also for things like gameplay and platforming, a bit like Hat and Time and Mario is also in there. So, so uh, a bit yeah. of grab loads of bits and bobs from just a variety of different platformers, really. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much the main inspirations. We okay. probably get compared to Breath of the Wild. <laughs> it's nothing like Breath of the Wild. 
Okay, so uh, yeah. should, we, should we move on to the some, some of the so, breakdown? So just, uh, yeah. Or do you want yeah, me to? I just, I just noticed in the uh, in the chat, um, people are comparing it to Journey and Cameo. Is that probably about right? Um, gameplay wise, no, no, um, not really. <laughs> yeah, because um, I'd say the actual main gameplay part of a game relatively fast paced, isn't it? Where you're swinging about and yeah, I'm like, I would say Journey's. Really slow paced, isn't it? Um, our game is the complete opposite. It's, it's, it's supposed to be like fast paced, um, get around the map as quick as possible, and yeah. <laughs> Would now be a good time for me to have a little play before we look at some of the characters? Sure. Uh, just... uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, while, while, so while Jude's having a quick play, I'll, I'll ask you a couple of questions about um, the idea itself and uh, how a team of one programmer, seven designers, like, why did you come up with this? Okay, so firstly, like, because of our one program, Crammer 7 designers, we actually wanted to say, okay, we wanted to play to our strengths. And we had, like, three very good environment people in there so we can build like, a, quite an interesting world within our game. And then um, we thought, so what type of game probably is most helpful for the one program we thought platform is hmm. you can uh, make, I don't know, Josh, you can speak about why you want to do platform. Well, I just thought, you know, uh, at least when we started, I thought, like, how hard could a few movement mechanics be, right? Platformer seems the easiest thing to do. <laughs> uh, that, that's a very student approach to most things. How hard can it be? <laughs> oh, yeah, very hard. <laughs> As it turned out. Um, so just uh, what's going on here now? So we started off, and Duke ran up to a little girl. Who's the little girl? That will be the main character's sister. Um, okay. That's just an example of how you might get a quest or... A mission in the game, and then uh, for the sake of the demo, we just fade you into the actual mission. Okay, so this mission is you're going to collect um, your sister's frog, is it? Yeah, her, her yeah. pet frog, which a bird stole. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, talk us through the core gameplay mechanics as Duke's running around here. Um, so I mean, this this starting area, it, it literally just teaches you, you know, how to jump, how to, like what climbing is. It'll teach you how to use glider. And it will also teach you our main mechanic is the grappling hook, um, very important. And then, I mean, I don't want to do spoilers, but later on, it'll, it's going to teach you how to attack and it's going to show you what to attack. Um, Let's just hope it. But heads up, the AI is a total work in progress. Yes, um, the teleport <laughs> is the very um, indecisive feature. So, yeah. OK. Um, so, at the beginning of the year, you guys have you all pitched a load of different uh, I've never game done ideas. Um, oh, oh, you the combat. I saw you was talking about. Yeah, I've, ne I've never died before. So, a live a live demonstration of me dying in a game. Oh, there we go. It's not worked. There we go. It's better. But weirdly, I, I'm getting. A, I don't know if the Twitch is working okay. I'm getting a few frame rate drops. So, I think I need to. The, the Twitch looks fine. I'm watching. I'm okay, monitoring cool. it now. Bit, uh, so the, the, the enemies look like uh, very mechanical. Why, why the mechanical enemies? So, written like, so Lewis and Oren predominantly worked on sort of the base story before, and they mentioned sort of the idea of integrating sort of ancient tech type objects to the game as sort of like a big contrast um, to the rest of the environment. And these are sort of like the initial ideas of how we could implement, I'd I guess, the ancient tech into the enemies and how they'd work. Um, but it's gone through quite a few different designs, really, the ancient tech, wasn't it? Yeah, we've only just recently kind of like gone with the design and just kind of gone, yeah, we'll just use this. We're kind of like wasting too much time like reiterating it, and it's time we don't really have. So, I mean, you just you saw a piece, I mean, a piece is, never mind, there's a, there's a delay on the stream, but you, uh, you just walked past a piece. Um, it's kind of like a blue metallic object that's like cracked oh yeah that and they're one, kind yeah. of like the ancient tech pieces um that you'll see throughout the game and it'll all lead up to a final event in the game <laughs> okay so that, there's your mystery story <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And there'll be more like challenge levels which are based in more dungeons based around the ancient tech as well okay so, so, so more open-ish environments so in the early game you're just getting a hint of this uh, yeah. ancient tech, and by the end of the game, it's going to be be much bigger part of it. Yes. Okay. 
That's, cool. that's quite cool. So, um, I can stop playing if you want. We can go to some slides talking about the characters. Uh, we'll, we'll just, we'll just, yeah. Let's just, let's just toggle back, back. Keep it running, Jim. Let's just toggle over to the slide and let's, uh, let's jump over to some of the development because that's quite interesting talking about the development, especially from the student perspective. Um, so the characters. So I'm guessing uh, Ollie, you took the lead on the main character. So talk us through what went into that. Okay, so. Um... Lauren had the idea of this character in the first place where she drew it and she wanted to represent, well, do a character which really isn't kind of represented in games before. So it's like, you know, the young girl and that kind of culture. And we wanted it to be definitely unique in terms of the character design. And then it was my job to try and recreate what she drew. And that was a bit of a journey. Um, so it's gone through many iterations to get the art style right, really. So, yeah. So I think it's quite interesting that what you said about the iteration because um, first years especially and in second year, um, they might not really understand how much iteration goes into finding the right look and feel. So, Ollie, how many times did you redo this character? <laughs> Only a couple. No, a lot. Um, um, because um, really sort of finding an art style where the stylized is in my case, anyway, I find it quite difficult to finalise or up how it's going to look, especially because my comfort zone isn't really with a sort of the cartoony or sort of cuteness to a character. I've always done sort of like creepy creatures before as my sort of thing, but it's, it's a quite an interesting learning process, and I've learned a fair bit and helped me to do the character stuff. Um, Lewis and Lauren helped me a lot on, along the way as well. Yeah. I, th I think that's I think that's really important about learning as you go and as you iterate. Uh, as an artist, as uh, students, see, they get into this mad habit of going, "Well, I have this really good first idea, and that's what I'm sticking with." But actually, if we use this as an example and look back to your first iteration on it, imagine that being in the game now. It would complete. It'd be a completely different look and feel. Yeah. So. Let's just go to the next slide. Yeah, to Wisp pick? next. <laughs> like um, Mira, the main character's sort of companion character, which goes along the way with you. And again, the same situation where it's gone through a lot of many different designs. Um, but this sort of has a lot of gameplay alongside it. So he will pick up some puzzle cubes for you and light up areas and things like that and interact with the world which is really cool um the idea of the wisp was aaron's and he implemented the first mechanics to kind of persuade the team into implementing it and we were quite impressed with it so yeah and that's quite a well it's a very big part of the game yeah. so just so on so this wasn't originally part of the the initial pitch uh, but as uh, as a as a design team you can actually you can see here as a good example of coming up with the idea, building a proof of concept. So uh, we talk about this all the time, Duke does in prototyping and, and Carla does is that a proof of concept design can actually lead into a much bigger picture. So I think this is a nice little example of saying, I've got this idea, showing the idea and then the rest of the team going, yeah, that's, let's get this wrong with it. Yeah, because I think like a few of us were a bit confused with the initial idea before we saw what it could actually do. But I think it, it does help with the personality of the game as well, especially. Right? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the main reasons for it though as well is like, like I always said, um, like when it picks up like these puzzle cubes, like imagine like Mira having to pick up this cube and having to carry it with her while having to attack, swing. It's just kind of like, um, it's almost like an accessory that just helps like add additional mechanics into the game, that's all. And the design, I, I don't even know at this point where the design came from. Um, I know it's based off a of ferret, and that's about it. Um, but loosely, loosely based <laughs> off a of ferret. It's been called a dog as well as a dragon, a cat, quite a lot, a cat, a weasel. It's yeah. At this point, it's whatever you want it to be. Uh, <laughs> it's an yeah. animal. Yeah. Cool. All right. Cool. It's onwards it's to the end. A lot. So we have like. Surrounding our three levels, we have a sort of a main hub area, which is your village, where you, like your family and other NPCs are going to be. Um, these NPCs are 
being made and designed by uh, Lewis and Lauren to sort of help out with the sort of character stuff. Um, I think the way they've sort of done it as well is um, just help because we want a fair bit of NPCs to make the village look cool. Um, they're sort of being made modularly, so they've got the sort of same sort of base mesh, same base head, and they kind of just adjust it slightly per design. Um, yeah, so I think we're slowly or well, starting to add the actual function to the NPCs now, or just started doing that. Yeah. Are they, um, will they be part of the story, or are they just going to be wandering around? Uh, I, uh, will you interact with them too much? Or, or not much all of them. Uh, most of them you will. Uh, for example, like the second one on there, uh, her main thing is she's like the tail, like, she's like kind of like a tailor person, so you can go to her and get new like costumes and stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, they're not all the NPCs either. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have more. Uh, I don't know how many more, but yeah, you're going to be able to interact with the majority of them. Cool. Okay. But the, each one of those NPCs is going to either progress the story or give you a quest or some kind of interaction or something. Or just a bit of world building, really. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, so. We, can we, can we, we, as we were watching Duke play, we talked a little about the enemies for a, a bit, but let's, so let's, let's delve into that a little bit more. Yeah, so um, initially we didn't really plan or discuss whether we wanted enemies or not, but as we were playing and turning about, we we thought we needed something to sort of pad it out and make things a bit more interesting. And sort of, there was no kind of challenge for the players you were singing about, so we had the idea of implementing the enemies and decided to do it with the ancient textile, like some parts of the environment. And these images here showcase some of the designs. So um, the big image there has got the sort of melee walking an enemy at the front in the background is sort of the turret enemy. And um, the big drill was a sub boss that we're kind of sort of having ideas about now. It's not fully implemented or uh, we've just got a few initial designs of it where it's kind of like a boulder chase sequence where it's kind of drilling behind you through the canyon. And the top right is a concept for a flying enemy that we still need to look into doing. Oh, so these so these enemies sort of tie into a secondary gameplay mechanic on that. So your primary gameplay is your uh, swinging and traversal, and then these enemies are sort of like a secondary loop almost. Yeah, that's why, um, for example, that drill sort of tech worm boss enemy, um, we want the actual mechanics of that boss to be the, the traversal. That's why you're kind of running away, chase, um, being chased from it, so you'll be sort of um, as you're climbing and swinging away, or appear in front or behind you, just drilling out of the environment, and you need to dodge it instead of you directly attacking it. Really, because cool. we have sort of basic combat in the game, but we didn't really want that to be the main focus. How are you? Yeah. Go, go on. Can we go? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, um, all of like the enemies and the attacking and stuff, so they're done by designers essentially. And that's because, I mean, we can't throw this huge workload onto Josh because Josh, you know, has the actual game to make, like the grappling and the quests and stuff. Um, so that's why we're not having like a main focus because, I mean, none of us are like programmers by heart. So we don't know how to make these super complicated AI enemies. And that's why right now they, I mean, they they're full of bugs, but which we hope to get sorted. And our attack system's nothing amazing, but it's like it's basic. It does the job, and yeah, it's just more of a side thing rather than our main goal. But the enemies. I was going to ask about this uh, new flying enemy, which I've not seen before. And um, without a ranged weapon, how you're going to have to get really close to it. Yeah, that's the issue we've been having because, like, when we first just um, discussed, oh, what kind of enemies could we have? Face to play, so we said, oh, "Okay, we can have a turret. That's very simple to implement. Uh, a sort of running, chasing melee enemy, which you can do like a relatively basic behavior tree for." And then we just thought, "Hey, why don't we try as you're swinging about a flying enemy?" But we don't know really how it could attack you or you could attack it yet. So mm. we haven't really found a proper function. For um, it. Well, so far with the turrets, for example, like they fire like projectiles at you, and one of the ways to kill them is to hit the projectile back. Uh, um, the deflect is very similar to that of Breath of the Wilds, where you can like deflect projectiles back. Yeah. Um, so that's our main way right now of like destroying the enemies at range. Uh, the enemies can also attack other enemies. Not they won't like target them, but like for example, if you get behind an enemy while ranged turrets 
uh, shooting you, it will shoot the enemy. So that's another way that you can actually hurt enemies. There was a suggestion on Twitch of um, oh, a couple actually now. So using a grappling hook to pull it down or implementing a boomerang. But I seem to remember the grappling hook snaps to the nearest. Um, I don't know if we saw any in this in, when I was playing, but there's all those little glowy blobs in the sky, and the grappling hook snaps to those, doesn't it? Which might cause issues if you're in the middle of a of a swing and then you snap to an enemy, and all of a sudden you're jumping off to one side. I think we did have the kind of initial discussion where we can kind of use that firing enemy as some kind of or you can get rid of it with a grapple hook, but mm. I, I think that's why we haven't really tried looking at it yet because we could probably mess up the swing yeah. mechanics. Mm. Yeah, I would say like making the grapple hooks start moving. I mean, I think Josh has like kind of um, tried doing that a bit, um, but I would say I think jo yeah, like Josh is going to answer that one. I think <laughs> we regularly play around with like ideas for these kind of play mechanics, but I think it's just kind of we do what's like necessary for the game at the current moment. Okay. So it's like, it might work its way in, it might not find its place. Um, it all depends on like how we all feel the game progressing and where we want to take it. I think we call that agile development, don't we? <laughs> yeah, so uh, agile development, experimentation, I think this is a big part of game dev and actually mm -hmm. not being precious about your work, which is really important. Uh, some students get really sort of worked up over i've been working so hard on this one little thing for a long time that the idea of it just scrapping it because it's not working can actually scare some students but i think that's something that hopefully you've learned over the course of the outside that what you work on can just get scrapped at any minute yeah, yeah especially mm -hmm. yeah. assets as well like, yeah we have redone so many assets just yeah <laughs> like i think there's like three versions of the village or something like that yeah Okay, should we move on to some environments? So, so I'm guessing this is you going to take the lead on this one, Chris. Um, yeah, I, I will. Uh, so this is just some like early work we did. So this was probably the stuff we did in like the first like couple of weeks of um, development. Uh, so this was I don't know probably around October time maybe. And our our main goal was like we was like oh if we just white box everything out we can go in and replace the assets. We thought that was a great idea. Um, it wasn't a great idea because I don't think really any like maybe the top left one some of that is still being used but n none of our white like gray boxes are being used right now and that's just because we had no mechanics to start with so when we were white boxing these we'd like place like you can see like the emissive like green walls for example we'd be like okay this is a climb wall but then we wouldn't know how the climb wall would fully work and then for grapple hooks we'd Grapple points would just place down like an emissive white cube, and we'd be like, okay, this is a grapple point. We'll we'll just kind of guess like the distance that we can get from this. And then when we actually got all the mechanics in, we were kind of like, yeah, this just doesn't work. Even after replacing like the um, the white box like mechanics with actual mechanics, we were just like, yeah, this is not fun. This doesn't work. Uh, so we actually ended up scrapping most of our white box early on and remaking them. Um, so yeah, this was just to show you some of our early work, which we actually ended up scrapping most of it. Do we move on to that uh, that village, unless yeah. you've got any questions about white box in there, Matt, and the, the yeah, learning think, experience? Think, I, it's quite interesting. Yeah, I think that it is really important to for anyone that's uh, part of game dev is to understand that game dev goes in cycles. So your early grey boxing, yeah, we scrapped it all as you went through, but you probably learned a lot by doing that, learned how the mechanics are going to work, whether they're going to work in this scenario. So that's the entire purpose of that early stage mm. grey boxing is to learn from it and to see whether the game is actually fun and actually to make changes accordingly without actually have spend, spending months and months doing all these assets that then are going to go disappear. For those wondering where, uh, why we've lost Josh, he's gone to look for a charger. I think he's running low on power. <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's, I think he's running off his phone for the, for for the, the video. Camera. Yeah, hopefully we'll we'll get him back soon. So, do you want to f uh, fill us in on how then uh, how, how it evolved from that grey boxing into this uh, more uh, certainly more yeah, so, picturesque environment? So this is the village. So uh, I think we explained earlier. This is like the central hub. So this is where you know Mira lives. She lives with other people. This is where the NPCs are going to be. This is where you'll get your quests, go out to other places, and so on. 
So this one right now, I think this is our third iteration on the village. Yeah. Um, this doesn't show all of it off because the rest of it is just not finished. And it probably won't get finished because this is getting scrapped, actually. And we are making another iteration, which will hopefully be our fourth and final one. And the reason for that is just each one we've kind of like run into problems. Like some of them were kind of like, well, this one's, you know, it'd be fun to use them like grapple hook to get around, but this one obviously doesn't accommodate to that. And then this one, we kind of like, oh, it's too tight together. We need to kind of space it out more, give everything, everything more room. And yeah, hopefully the next time we like make this village, which should be soon, um, we'll hit the nail on the head and just get it right. <laughs> Finally. Cool. Welcome back, Josh. Are you uh, plugged in now? Hey. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Fixed it now. Okay, excellent. So should we move on from the village then? Yeah. Or the village that will never be seen again, maybe, to the, to the Redwood Forest. Uh, yeah, so this is the... The first environment which you will go to. Um, this is not mine. This is Brad's level. He's been he's been white boxing this. He's been developing this. Um, so yeah. So his goal with this level was to add a ton of verticality. And we had this idea where if we had like these big tall redwood trees in, we could maybe add platforms to them, and you could like grapple around them uh, onto them, and then you could get huge heights. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Um, yeah, I never know what else to say about it. That's okay. We can. I like the idea of going vertical, with, especially with the grappling hook. Yeah, being able to move up like, and down. You've got a, you've got a couple of images in the top left and the bottom right of these sort of like really interesting bits of architecture. Mm. Uh, I'm guessing this is this is you trying to tell story through the environment here. Um, yeah, this I, all that was Brad's idea. We didn't really discuss much of that. Brad kind of just, you know like it just showed us it and uh, we liked it so we, we're going with it right now um his is like the main level that shows like this kind of like storytelling i'd say um but yeah yeah i think, I think as environment artists and level designers that's important to actually say yes you have this overarching story this overarching gameplay that you want to get across but you still have freedom to put your own little stories and little things into the way that you position your world, the way that you texture and light your mm. world as well. So that's important. Okay. Uh, so let's go to the next one, Duke. Uh, canyon, yeah. canyon and mushroom, or canyon and or mushroom, or the mushroom canyon, the canyon of mushrooms. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this this is my environment that I'm working on, and with this, I just wanted to go more in like the fantasy kind of theme, and I just wanted to, to make it like completely like contrast it from my other environments. So it's almost like you're entering like just a different game at this point because um, um, straight after this level it goes back to kind of like a, um, like the final level is just um, not fantasy at all really themed. So this level kind of just I wanted to kind of separate it uh, and go a bit crazy with it, but it also allows me to kind of uh, not stick to like you know I don't have to be realistic as in like I don't have to make like a tree look normal in this. I can make it whatever I want. So. It just gives me a lot of like creative freedom, like doing this, doing it this way. And this level is also the level that you see in the demo, um, or part of this level, not all of it. Um, but yeah. Just an interesting yeah. question because um, you were saying there that Brad worked on the other one, and I know like Ollie's worked on one, the other Ollie. I mean, um, I think some students might be wondering how you're maintaining um, the the. Um, a consistent style when there are different people uh, you've all got your you've got this level ollie's got one brad's got one how are you maintaining a consistent style amongst them um i'd say this was a lot easier to do in this studio mm -hmm. because i mean me brad and ollie all sat next to each other so we could literally turn to each other and kind of go does this work um and then we could just go no oh yes uh we could tell them how to change it um we also uh, quite a bit of the time we use each of the assets, um, so that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm the main person who will do like the foliage in each level, so that kind of helps brings it all together. Um, we all use kind of like the same smart materials and substance, um, which helps a lot to bring like the textures the same. So we're all just kind of using the same techniques okay. um, and then just asking each other if it works. You, you, you said at the beginning there that it was easier in the studio. How? So just a, 
an idea of remote working because I know some studios is it already in the blind forest is all remote workers yeah yeah, yeah so yeah, so about uh, how are you finding the difference now then when you're not able to just turn around and and comment um, what differences it, it started off very slow mm. um did the process because obviously none of us are really used to it I mean the most experience we have is just with standard uni uni work because you do that at home a lot of it yeah. um but we set up a Trello board because we didn't originally have that because we had whiteboards that we could just go up to and write down stuff on. Um, but as soon as we started working remotely, we set up like a Trello board and that has been like extremely useful. We try and update it every day. And then at the start of the day, we'll usually have like a quick meeting to go through what we're doing. And then at the end of the day, we'll have another meeting and we'll be like, okay, what did you do? Mm -hmm. Um, and then we, we're always constantly chatting in Discord as well. Um, and then we make use of like the share screen function in Discord. So we can share screens and like kind of help people through like certain processes. Excellent. Cool. That would be really good if you, any of you end up in a working. Who, who is it who does Orion the Blind Forest? What's the studio? Uh, Moon Studio. Yeah, Moon Studio, if any of you well, end Bloom, up. Bloom, 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 yes. Cool. So we'll move on to the. Do you say this is the. Which level is this? Uh, this is like the final, the final one, one, so this is right at the end of the game. So this is um, always not oh, this one, the other Ollie that we have. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of going with this um, like jungle, kind of like Aztec vibe. Um, and it's took him quite a while to get the look right. Um, he's gone probably through the most iterations out of everyone. But right now, it's, it's looking great. He's kind of nailed the look right now. Um, and yeah, it's just, just been iterating pretty much. And... He's got some really cool, unique puzzles in his now, mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I think I think this one's really interesting to talk about through that iteration process because I remember early on it started off as sort of like um, on the shore with a lot of boats, and it was almost like desert island pirate themed almost. Um, but <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm guessing I'm guessing through gameplay testing and trying to make it consistent in the story is that that has actually evolved over time to become this more um aztec ruins sort of vibe well yeah we've all trying we've all tried to like find our kind of like uniqueness to our level so with like uh, braz you know you have the huge trees and the verticality and stuff and you have those ruins now with mine it's more fantasy and now with always he's only recently added these cool aztec ruins in and that's kind of give his like um like a unique style so since he's like found that style, he's been like kind of um, smashing through progress with it. Cool. Um, and then we move on to what you're referring to as the dungeons. Um, yes. Yeah, so these have also been through a lot of iterations <laughs> as well, like a lot. Um, and we've kind of just, I think we've, I think we're going with this now. Um, I'm pretty sure we're going with this. These are like what you will find at like the end of each level and you go through them. It's kind of like, it only mainly focuses on like the mechanics. Like it's just heavily focused on mechanics. Like going through our levels, you know, we kind of focus on storytelling, visuals and mechanics. These are like mainly mechanics that we're focusing on. So in the top right, you will see kind of like the challenge rooms that we want to implement. And these are going to be like in the dungeons. And if anyone's played Hat in Time, and uh, you've played through the time rifts, you'll know exactly what I mean by these rooms. And it's practically just a void world where you go in and it's just, it just tests kind of your skills with the mechanics and they're meant to be like more difficult. Uh, we're also adding some like optional ones of these at the end of the game. And they will just be for people wanting to challenge themselves um, a little further and just to extend gameplay overall. Sounds pretty cool. Uh, I, I like the idea of adding this sort of like extra you've, you've told your story because it's not a massive game that you're making in terms of time scale is it it's a, it's a short experience that is focused heavily on this this, this traversal mechanic so adding in um, these sort of like challenge rooms which are all about the mechanics that you feel and actually just say no if you want more just pure gameplay here's that more gameplay going through yeah cool and then i think we got on to sound so uh, i mean it's so important in a game isn't it a game a movie sound is such a key factor in the immersion in the enjoyment i mean i still i still 
I think I played recently, didn't I? The Battlefield 1942 music uh, at some point in one of our Zoom chats. Um, that that theme tune still goes through. There's the Red Alert ones where it changes. Or there, there are theme tunes th through time games and what have you that just they take you back to the game and that held that immersion. So it is a challenge for us because if you remember back to the beginning of this video, we talked about how we take students from games design and from games programming and there's, there's no audio there. So that is one of our challenges. Um, so we go back to this other slide. Josh, if you want to talk, us about, talk to us a little bit about how we ended up with um, hopefully these two people engaging with that process. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, kind of working with uh, music composers and music technicians um, is something that doesn't really get covered in the course because it's, it's not really like the main focus. You know, if you want to become a games programmer, you're going to learn the code. If you want to become a games designer, you're going to learn the design skills. There's not really that overlap for like learning the music or, or like even sometimes the integration of that music. Um, so working in the studio and having to make like a full game for a commercial release and with the importance of music, like you say, it kind of becomes necessary for us to find somebody to do our music. Um, and we were lucky enough to be contacted by both Abby, who's uh, the one on the left, who is um, she's a music student at the University of Huddersfield. She does the sound design and the sound effects. Um, and the other is Tyler, who's on the right. Um, he's a music composer. He lives in Idaho in America. So he's like seven hours behind us, which is sometimes an issue. Um, and he's kind of the more composer side of it. Um, we're really lucky to be working with like <laughs> these, these people that they're incredibly talented and they kind of bridge the gap between us knowing what we want from the game and them kind of knowing how to do it. Should we, um, should we, I don't know uh, if you want to. Okay, so should we play one of Tyler's? Oops. Sure. Some of his music here. Hopefully the audio is coming through just nicely. <laughs> so um, Tyler works on a, a lot of indie games and he has more experience in the wider industry as a whole, uh, which is really useful to us because, I mean, we, we don't have that experience. He's already suggested processes and methods to us, um, which, which are like completely new. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's sometimes very difficult. We actually had a music meeting today. Um, it's difficult trying to convey what we want because it's like he has the knowledge and the terminology. And we don't have like that knowledge to be able to bridge that gap with him. Yeah. Um, he has this SoundCloud portfolio. Um, which has a load of great tracks on it. Definitely worth checking out. And then we'll listen to some of Abby's mm -hmm. more sound effect content. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, Abby's a student at the university. Um, she's incredibly talented. A, a couple of other things on her portfolio, because um, she does mainly the sound effects and like dub overs of trailers. Um, she has this uh, this horror scene sound design piece, which honestly terrified me when I watched it and uh, she has a, a dub over of the Animal Crossing trailer and honestly when I watched it like when we were looking at these guys portfolios I honestly thought I was watching the Animal Crossing trailer that's not a lie right, cool. it's really exciting that they want to work with us and or with you guys and create something Incredibly so. um, that's really gonna take it to the next level I think that was one of the benefits of us posting on Instagram and social media a lot because we kind of showed case our work out there and Many people reached out to us, including those two. Mm -hmm. So, cool. Okay. So, yeah. so well, I might come. I might come back to that uh, social media chat at the very end. But uh, let's just keep going. Let's see if my machine holds up to playing four videos at once. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, what was this, this mecha <laughs> the mechanics chat? Was this is this yours, Josh, talking about the um, <laughs> yeah the grappling, the um, joys of the grappling hook? I mean, you can stop those if you want. If you don't want all of them playing at once. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. What, what might be better, Jake, is if you just toggle to the gameplay and just play the gameplay. I can, yeah, I can jump straight out to the gameplay. Yeah. That's, um, <laughs> um, I, think that, I think that'd be the better option. Yeah. Uh, let me just go back to a slide that doesn't kill my machine. Then, okay, we'll go there. Okay, so Josh, you're going to talk us a little bit about the. <laughs> oh, I guess that is my area. So let's, talk, let's talk about the mechanics and how you, as a as the, the programmer, actually went about building these mechanics. So right from the start, being a single programmer in a team of you know uh, seven designers, one of the main questions I had to solve very early on was 
how big I allowed the scope to get. Because, I mean, even the graph rope, this took like about three months to really get done. And it still has a couple of small bugs that I want to fix. But I had to, we, had, we had to balance that with kind of wanting to make the game fun and, you know, actually people wanting to play it. So we kind of decided on if it's going to be a platformer, we want to make it about the movement mechanics. Um, and I had to decide pretty early on which movement mechanics we want. Um, and I, we kind of thought like, well, why don't we try out a grappling hook? Because I've never really seen a platformer put a lot of focus on a grappling hook. So with that in like in the forefront of what we're doing, we decided the other two mechanics, you know, good thing is coming threes. Um, these kind of have to synergize really well with it and allow us to to kind of build gameplay pieces that have all these mechanics interact with each other. And it, it was pretty obvious that we should do gliding and climbing. And I think the glider is where a lot of people take the Breath of the Wild similarities from. Um, of course, when we decided we needed the combat layer as well, um, we added that in. They used a, a root motion system. Uh, goes through a couple of iterations. I can talk in detail about <laughs> either of these if you want. So I'm, I'm just I'm distracted by playing. I, I, <laughs> oh, oh. I was actually just watching two play that. <laughs> or, 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 really or, or fail to play. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think it's a really good testament to the game uh, that Duke's being drawn into it and I'm being drawn into this watching. Uh, I'm just not very good with a control. I'm playing, I'm, I'm a mouse and keyboard person and this is painful for me. Stop, play, stop blaming the tools, Duke, and just... <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, so, also, um, also, I'm just rubbish. <laughs> so, at the beginning of the of the year, you did have quite a bit of trouble with uh, the grappling hook, didn't you? Yes, a little bit. Did you want me to talk about that? So, yeah, let's just talk about how um, the team and the studio and yourself actually how you, how you work to try and overcome that, and actually what what changes were made as you progressed through the learn the difficulties of putting this together. Well, it wasn't so much changes got made, but more so the, like, the continual learning process that we've already talked about in Canal Side Studios. Like, I came in with a vague idea of how to create this system. Yeah, the course prepares you quite a bit with like basic physics knowledge, um, maths for games. Uh, and I, I had a good idea of, you know, I could probably use a spring simulation type thing to do this. Um, but the problem is putting that into Unreal and doing it the way Unreal wants you to do. That was the, I mean, the problem I had with it. So it took, I mean, I spent a month looking through Unreal source code to try and figure it out before, you know, after Luke's help figuring out that there was a different way to do it. And then it was really quick to develop. As far as like changes, it was more about kind of keeping people updated and kind of having the awareness that like what if it doesn't get finished we kind of had to have that that plan b in our minds all the time okay so i think what's quite interesting about your team is that yes you are the only programmer but you do have a very uh techie designer on your team with aaron don't you um, yeah. <laughs> um, so so am i right in assuming that the one of your your kind of workflow is aaron or prototype a few things and then you as the program will come in and actually put it into clean code and, and implement it that way that has been what happened um quite a bit <laughs> let me say first say aaron is invaluable um so his, the kind of process is aaron is in blueprints with his extensive experience and able to put together gameplay mechanics and he puts together i mean there's a couple other things we'll cover in the next slide um he puts together so many of the smaller things like the puzzle mechanics and he started out having coded in blueprints the glider, the, the climbing, um, what else was there? Yeah, that. Um, so that was really, um, really useful for me to be able to focus squarely on the, the grappling hook, get that right. And we could still have those mechanics in the game to use Oops. while um, <laughs> trying to develop all the, the design and the environments. Um, like you say about uh, going back and then re-going over it, I, I've done that quite a bit. So. Sorry, just ignore me. I'm I'm failing miserably. <laughs> I just, 
Uh, just uh, what's quite interesting, Josh, um, someone in the chat is asking uh, to explain a little bit how the grappling hook actually works. Okay, <laughs> I prepared this. Um, no, 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 no. So, <laughs> the way I approach the grappling, the grappling hook is that it needs to be kind of a physical simulation. <laughs> Um, because we didn't want that kind of just cause style grappling where it pulls you towards an object, despite the fact that that's easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> have, I, have I just <laughs> gone all the way back to the... the... <laughs> no! Sorry, oh, Josh, I, I, I'm, you, I'll let you... I'm, it's take me all the way back to the beginning, by because I missed... Yeah, you died too many times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm rage quitting now. Sorry, sorry, Josh, you carry on. <laughs> Fine. Nobody wants to hear code. Not rage quick, too. Keep playing. Okay, well, do it again. <laughs> Get good. Get good, yeah. <laughs> All right, um, sorry, Josh. Go on. Anyway, yeah. So we decided this uh, this whole grappling rope has to be a more physical simulation than it is like an arcadey mechanic. So I kind of had to abstract the problem out into what I really needed it to be. Um, and it was like, it's a rope, and what's the best like physics? Oops. Um, abstraction I can use for that. I figured it's, it's pretty similar to like a really stiff spring. So if I was able to implement, say, a spring simulation, that would <laughs> give me like a really good starting point from which to develop the rest of it. Um, and that's exactly what happened. I mean, um, you can easily add force to, to any like character in Unreal. Um, and by doing that, I was able to start out with this spring simulation, tweak the values a little bit to make it seem a little bit more like a rope, and then add in a few edge cases where, like, say, if you're above the grappling point, then it doesn't need to act like a spring because it's a rope. Um, and kind of taking feedback from everybody else on the team as I went and developed it through, um, it kind of developed it into what it is now. Oh. Um, I just I think everyone's laughing at the fact that oh, Duke cannot play this it's play a, game it's at the moment. It's <laughs> It's controllers. Hook. It's controllers. You're making, this, you're making this game look with, like Dark Souls hard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jackie Daxter. That's the easy part of the platform. You know you have camera controls, right? Yeah. What's the what's the what's grappling hook on the keyboard? Um, it's the left mouse button. Left mouse button. Okay. Right. Let's try uh, yeah. It. Use key, use keyboard and mouse, and you can't blame your tools too. Well, no. But if I'm if I'm just as bad, what do I blame then? Oh, the, the chat the chat saying they found the new drinking game. What? Watch you and drink every time you die. <laughs> uh, <coughs> it's just getting funny now. Uh, right, go on, Bill. One more try. Um, Matt, do, okay. can you come and f do this for me? We may have to uh, drive two hours and, and break some quarantine yeah. stuff, but... What? Where am I? Oh. Uh, cool. So what I want to um, sort of branch on to a little bit more is... Um, Obviously, at the moment, the second years are some of them have been applying for Canal Side and they're going to be going through their interview process and stuff like that. Um, what kind of tips uh, Oops. can you give them for, for next year uh, to actually give them the best start to their their, their time in Canal Side? Um, I would say, as as soon as you know that you're on the team. Um, you probably want to get together, you know, get like this is what we did. We like got together the summer before and, we started, really. Yeah. yeah, and we were already planning out the game. And Aaron even put together kind of like like a tech demo before we even started. So when we went to Canal Side, we just brought up all this stuff that we already like did for the game, and that's the stuff that we presented um, to the uh, to like Martin Duke. And we didn't really have any other game ideas, and that's because we have been developing this game like idea for so long. We were just like, yeah, this is definitely what we want. We can, we can do this, and yeah. So that's something I said you need to do, because um, one year seems like a very long time, but it is not. It, it goes really by, isn't. it goes by so quick, and then like it's like by the time it's like March, you're like, what have we done? We need to make a game. Um, even though you have been working all this time, it's kind of like, it doesn't seem like um, you've I don't know, done much. So yeah, definitely uh, pre-plan as soon as you know you're in Canal Side. Um, yeah. Yeah. Shoot, I can't judge this. I can't judge the distance in the in the. Um... Oh, I have noticed that I found a bug. So when it throws. Yeah, th I, I, sure. I, I'm sure, also... dude, it's a bug. <laughs> no, no, a different, a different. Not not that one. No, I'm still rubbish. But I found yeah, a bug to make my life have... easier. Because we have soft checkpoints and big checkpoints, and it doesn't reset the soft ones. Uh, yeah, no, I, I can't. For some reason, I can't use the distance of the platforms. Not not this one. The one at the end. 
So I mean, I'm just rubbish at this bit. But Jake, I, I, it looks like you're deliberately trying, trying to die. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm going to go with that. I am deliberately trying to. It's this one here. For some reason, I don't seem to get the distances. Just. Oh, oh, okay. oh, oh, oh there oh, we go. Yeah, got it. Yes. Well, I think, I think I think the top tip there is um, talk to somebody while playing the game. Oh, thank you for playing. Yeah. Thanks. And it should go into the trailer now. Though. You know what it should do there is if you died more than a certain number of times, it should say thank you for playing badly. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm like in the uh, chat. I think every build now should have a secret setting that is a death counter for when you play. <laughs> I've just um, I've just noticed that. <laughs> I've just seen the Twitch stream. Oh, this is, oh, yeah. this is, it seems your, your PC only seems to like when I'm playing video stream. Well, the, only my old PC, which is technically cur my current PC as well. Uh, actually, should we? I'll tell you what. Uh, how about I quit that and then we go back to here uh, and then we'll play the trailer. Well, maybe we'll load the trailer up separately. So I've quit the game now. I managed to not rage quit, so that's good. Yeah. Josh, uh, any advice for the programmers that are, are going to be going to be starting next year? Uh, definitely. <laughs> so the first thing is decide on your source control technique immediately. That is the first thing you have to do. Um, without that, you're going to run into countless problems down the line. I mean, we use Perforce, which is great for Unreal, um, and that honestly has been our saving grace quite a few times. Um, secondly, I'd say a little bit with what I said earlier, um, make sure you scope your game correctly. Because feature creep is, it, it's always going to be a thing. You're always going to like play the game, iterate on it, and want to add new things. So if you've already decided on this huge, complex game that is fairly feasible in the time frame you have, then when the time comes that you want to add new things and kind of test them out, you're not going to have the time to do it, especially as a programmer. Because I think if I look at my Trello, I've got like a list of like 25 bugs I need to fix. I think Duke, you only saw a few of them. <laughs> no, that, I think I was the biggest bug in that game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so we've got a couple more slides, I think. Some mechanics ones. Although I think we've seen all the mechanics, I haven't think, we? I, think, I, think, I think we kind of talked about them as we went yeah. uh, through the game. Through the uh, awful demonstration of gameplay. I don't know about awful. I think absolutely abysmal is more accurate. <laughs> Next time, next time Matt plays, how's that? We, okay. Yeah. We should, maybe we should do. We, or we should. We should get me, you. Actually, let's not get Ash. He'll probably be amazing at it. But me, me, you, and Daryl will have a playoff. How how many times can we do the demo level badly? Actually, you're probably alright, Matt. So here's some modular level components. I think that we've got going on. So, Is there anything you want to talk about on these these particular bits? Oh yeah. So this is um, not the bulk of what Aaron does, but. This is like a testament to how useful Aaron is as a blueprinter. And I think pretty much everything you see in this video, um, you know, it's stuff like this he can do in a day um, or half a day in blueprints. What maybe in C++ code would take me far longer. Um, so this is kind of more of the, the puzzle mechanics. Um, some of the stuff that's going to tie a little bit more of the story to our gameplay. And Chris, I think you'll be able to talk a little bit more about placing those in the levels. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, a lot of these are kind of like used throughout mo like multiple levels. So it's not kind of like we ask Aaron to do something and then we only use it in like a certain level. We do have some unique ones. So like the top two are kind of like unique to certain levels. Uh, but then you have like the things like on like the far top right we have these like light towers where if you can hit them and it'll kind of like that charge electric to the next one so it can like help trail you through um your levels so that's used in i know it's used in the uh, brad's level it's used in my level um and i don't know if it's used in the last level but uh, i mean it can be it's just it's just something to um that we can easily put down just to create more gameplay um so yeah this is something that aaron's really really good at um you can even just message him, put it on Trello, and it'll usually have it done within like a day. Um, but yeah, it's this is super helpful stuff. I think this is again comes like this testament of visual scripting. Um, the the implementation of it into the games industry has, has changed the way that games can be made. So all we have to do is look at the history of Canal Side and go back to 
Yoho Koblamo, Missing Rio, and, and see how a huge portion of their time was spent just building the engine to actually build the game. Whereas now we've got Unreal and Visual Scripting that they say Aaron can put together a mechanic in a day that gives you an idea whether it's going to work, and then Josh can go in and optimize it and clean it up later with C++, which, um, which again, is, is really nice to see all of the different disciplines working well together, the artists, the designers, the, uh, the tech and the programmers all, all collaborating to actually prototype. Uh, that kind of answers the question, Matt. Actually, somebody uh, Scott was asking, why didn't we just use blueprints exclusively, um, as it's so much faster? Because it's not optimized. Yeah, it's um, generally about a third slower, I think, isn't it, at runtime? Yeah, at least. Yeah. Um, I think that's the average. Sorry, a third, a third slower, third percent slower uh, at runtime. Uh, Josh, are you, I mean, what, as the programmer on this team, how are you finding that the speed of not the implementation, but the impact on performance. Um, yeah, blueprints is not the most efficient way to do the coding in your game. It's really people underestimate it sometimes. I think especially programmers um, who love coding they underestimate it massively because it has such an advantage in like implementation speed. Um, one of, what a great workflow described earlier was um, you can make something in blueprints really quick, make a lot of changes. Um, and then kind of once you've got it nailed down you can take it over to C++ where it's going to be a lot more efficient um, you know looking back on it I kind of wish I'd done the grappling hook in blueprints and then ported it over to C++ because I think what a lot of people find there's a lot more help around for blueprints as well um, yeah but <laughs> efficiency you definitely want to use C++ uh, Especially when you're doing quite a lot of like um, a lot of like vector math calculations, you're calculating normals, multiplying them, stuff like that. Cool. Okay, so we've reached the end of the slides, uh, yeah. and this is our longest stream ever. We're at over an hour and a half now. So th <laughs> thanks to Canal Side guys for joining us for so long. Yeah. Uh, just before we finish up, I just want to throw it to the chat to see if any other questions come in about Canal Side or the team or the game just before we finish up. But um, I think it's uh, a really the, the the demo and the chat there is a testament to how well you guys are working together in the studio. Uh, a question about that demo: Is that demo? I know. I, I mean, I, I you send copies to me. Is that something that we can make available for people to play now, or are you holding out on that bit? So right now it's not public. Okay. Um, I actually sent you a link to a Discord server. Okay. So we've, we've kind of got this Discord server up and running. There's not much to it yet, but if, if you guys join that, especially um, being part of the uni, we're going to be looking for gameplay testers and people to just take a look at it and give us feedback. So I don't know if you wanted to put the link in the chat, join that. And then we're, we're kind of sending this, this demo out to a couple media people um, right now. We're going to be trying to take part in the Steam Games Festival, um, and it's going to be getting around to you know getting gameplay feedback. Um, and this demo will be regularly updated, um, or at least as much as we can with um, you know new gameplay features and what we okay. have. We'll put the link to the Discord in the description of the YouTube video once it's up, um, so people can see that. Sure. Uh, and then, uh, so what's our estimated time of? Uh, release so that people can get excited and get it on there. Oh, it's on Steam, isn't it? So they can put it on the Steam wish list now. Yeah, we have a Steam page. Yeah, so we'll put the link to Steam as oh, well. But we've got lots of links to remember to put on the YouTube map. <laughs> so, what, so, but yeah, what's the what's the ETA for um, release? I don't know. I, it's like when we uh, first started on our side, we made this roadmap and we was like, yeah, we'll do this by this, this by this, and then we was like, oh, we'll probably release by May and. Now we're just like, then we're like maybe June, and now we're like July, and then we're, August. and now it's kind of like <laughs> late July, early August, and that's literally at the end of our placement. Um, and it's just because uh, we're now only just starting to realize how much stuff we need for like an actual game, um, and you don't realize it until quite late. Yeah, that's definitely. It. There's a big difference between a tech demo and a game, isn't there? Oh yeah. It's kind of the benefit of keeping like the initial idea smaller though, because it's mm. allowed us that opportunity. To expand into that time. Okay, cool. Uh, Matt, anything else you want to add before we 
No, it's a, it's a good, I think, a very good stream, and uh, hopefully anyone that's interested either uh, on the Twitch or YouTube video can go and um, add uh, Mirror's Tale to your wish list, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll put the uh, link down below, or you can just search for Mirror's Tale. Uh, one last one, there's uh, somebody asking about when you can apply. Uh, yeah, it does, uh, this, they've just started, they've just applied now the second year, so if you're first year, about this time next year. Is when you can start playing. That was the last question that popped up. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. We'll do the uh, intro, outro, even. Cool. Catch you next time.